It's a well-known story in Newfoundland and Labrador, the story of resettlement. That time in the 60s when homes were floated and families uprooted, all in the name of chasing a better life. Most of us have seen and heard it all before, or have we? As it turns out, there's another chapter in resettlement history, a little known chapter, one written 30 years before the more famous Outport Exodus. This chapter began in Fortune Bay and ended right here on Lourdes Beach on Newfoundland's port of port Peninsula. It saw 27 English families travel more than 300 miles to a completely different culture, a French culture. And it's a story only now being told, thanks to one man who just wouldn't stop asking questions. Bill O'Gorman's grandfather was one of the first five Fortune Bay men to come to Lourdes. How he ended up here always fascinated Bill. After all, why would a group of English-speaking fishing families move to a remote French shore on the other side of the island? Nobody knew when they came up, how they came up, uh, who was responsible, uh, how they survived, was it good, was it bad, was it hard, you know? And uh, that was all part of our, our culture, uh, to, to get that revealed and, and the difficult times they had when they did come here. So Bill started looking for answers. His research took him from the kitchens of Lourdes to the archives of St. John's. And in the end, he found out enough to write a book on the subject. So he did. The Never Forgotten Days the story of the exodus from Fortune Bay to Lourdes. It was the dirty 30s, the depression years, and Fortune Bay outports were feeling it. Places like Harbor Breton, Sagona, and Miller's Passage. There was no money then, the fishery was poor, and people were hungry. Even in the city, times were hard in Newfoundland in the mid-30s. A full 25% of the island's population was on the dole. Welfare, six cents a day. Newfoundland was under British rule then, the commission of government. And that government came up with a plan, something it thought would help the poor fishermen in particular. It was a relocation plan, the original resettlement program, hatched 30 years before the infamous program of the 60s. The whole purpose was to get the poor people, the fishermen, right off the shores of Fortune Bay because, like I said, the, the, the stock market had crashed, the price of fish fell, the depression came on as a result, and there was no hope for the, for the settlers there, the fishermen there on the shores of Fortune Bay. But why Lourdes? And why fishermen from Fortune Bay? Well, history can thank two Roman Catholic priests for that, Father O'Reilly and Father Kerwin. Both priests were then serving on the Port-a-Port -Port Peninsula, and when they got wind of government's resettlement plan, they got excited. They wanted to build their Catholic congregation in Lourdes, and this seemed to be just the way to do it. Father Kerwin had served in Fortune Bay for a time, so he knew exactly where to find hungry Catholic families. And Father O'Reilly had inroads with government. It was perfect. You know, in the desperate times of the Depression, you know, in the 30s, that's, these were hard times and there was no hope for them. So when they were promised land and they were promised housing, they were promised uh, the fir plantations and the berry plantations and lots of fishing to be done on the shores along with farming and forestry, there was opportunities, you know. It was hope for the hopeless, endorsed by the Catholic Church. When we come back, we'll hear about the incredible journey from Fortune Bay to Lourdes. All 
of the original Fortune Bay settlers are gone now, but a small handful of their children are still living. Jim Vallis's father was one of the first five men to arrive in Lourdes. His family came from Miller's Passage, where Jim can still remember the hungry years of the early 30s. Yeah, I guarantee you more than once I cried for a piece of molasses of bread and couldn't get it. I mean, everybody was poor, right? Jim's father, like many Fortune Bay men, fished on the deep sea banking schooners. That meant he was away from his young family in Miller's Passage for months at a time. Miller's Passage, everybody used to go bank fishing, right? They go out in, in March and they wouldn't get back, some they wouldn't get back till before October. And I mean, them days, the skippers used to come in to drown two or three men. They come in and half hour after they'd be gone again, but three or four more, right? There was, men was a dime a dozen, you know, at that time. That's the most reason most of them left, right? They were happy to get away from bank fishing. Happy to get away from bank fishing, happy to be making a fresh start, Jim's father boarded the coastal boat that would take him to the place called Lourdes in December of 1934. One of the first five, he went ahead to help clear land and build houses. I don't know how they survived. Can you imagine five days on a coastal boat and then to leave and come up by train from Port of Ass and then by horse and sleigh? open horse and sleigh in December month. You know, it's unbelievable. It's 60 miles or so from Stephen Moore Crossing to Lourdes to here, you know, an open sleigh. So these settlers, you know, I don't know, they must have, they must be iron people. Jim Vallis was just 11 when he and his mom and sister finally joined their father that spring. On the road, not going in mud, right? Mud up to your knees when we came here in May. We had to come up on the, well, we didn't come up on the horse and cart, but they, they hauled stuff. Well, Mr. Gallo hauled everything, belonging, our belongings up on the truck on the horse and cart, but we walked behind. Well, if, I, if I could have got back then, I'd have been gone. Well, my son uh, was meant to, uh, if they had the, the opportunity to go back, Jim Ballas would swear today. He said if he could get back on that boat and go right back, he would have done it. My grandmother spoke the same thing. They thought they were coming to the land of milk and honey. That was the word she used to, to tell her children. But they were in for a shock. In Lourdes then, there was nothing but a forest. And the houses those first five men had come early to build, well, they were little better than shacks. There's nothing on the walls, only just wood, right? Then they start papering, my mother started papering and right to put newspapers underneath and then they get wallpaper and put on. Same way all through the house. Just a bare board for moving into it. In some places it wasn't even finished with board, right? It took its toll on some of the settlers, you know, and uh, uh, people just developed diseases like my grandmother. She perished uh, and suffered a lot and some of the uh, younger settlers, the children especially, you know, it's a wonder that more of them didn't perish from the cold, you know. They were true pioneers, these fishermen trying to be farmers, these fortunate people trying to survive on a foreign shore. And it was a one-way ticket. Government had paid to get them here, but there was no going back. From 1934 to 1936, five groups of people arrived from Fortune Bay. Many were from Miller's Passage. The last lot came in September of 1936 and landed here on Lures Beach. The coastal boat that brought them was the Kyle. Gordon Bullen remembers he was six years old. Gordon was aboard the old steamship along with his sister, brothers and mother, and all their worldly possessions. 
even their sheep. She brought everything, all the cooking gear and everything she had down there. They brought everything. Stove, wood stove and all. That's one thing we had no, never had a wolf fire get wood. Just different stone get wood. Yes, that was one good thing about Lourdes. There was one good thing about coming. The rest, I don't know. They sent us here farming in a place where it was like a jungle. That's what it was. You know, it was all forest everywhere. They were meant to be farmers, these Fortune Bay settlers, but sadly, that never came to be. Turns out the soil in many parts of Lourdes is poor, so farming never really was a viable option for the new settlers, despite everything they'd been told. But luckily, this was the American Air Force Base in Stephenville. The Americans started building the base in 1939, and that meant, for the first time ever, hourly wages for the men of Lourdes. Cash money for those willing to walk the 24 hours to get to Stephenville, Gordon Bullen was. Well, when I got there, my feet was all blisters because four moms said, well, you better get a bigger shoe than what you wear, see? But that's where I made a fool of it because my feet was slipping around into it and I got blisters. Geez, I couldn't walk that morning when they come to Horizon. Just go walk with the blisters. Then I had to break the blisters. And we got our own. I was only young then anyway, I was only 17. By all accounts, the base saved Lords and made that journey of a lifetime worthwhile. The Fortune Bay settlers are all buried in Lourdes. Gordon Bullen's parents, Jim Ballas' dad and mom, Bill O'Gorman's grandparents, all the people who cleared the path, if not for themselves, then for those who followed. Well, the stories reveal the, our heritage and our culture, the difficult times, you know. And I, I think it's important that the, our children and our grandchildren know the conditions that they experience to, to make a better life for their children and their grandchildren and, and the great-grandchildren for, for years and generations to come. When we come back, we'll take you to Fortune Bay, to the place this story started. Passage, Fortune Bay, a long, long way from the Port of Port Peninsula. Miller's Passage is where many of the Lourdes settlers came from. It's abandoned now. The little outport was resettled completely in the 60s. But Johnny Green and his family had shifted 30 years before. They were part of the exodus to Lords. Johnny and his mother were among the last lot to leave. They landed on Lourdes Beach in September of 1936. Johnny was an infant, barely over a month old. My daddy was out there before I was born. So I suppose like everybody, he wanted, you know, was pretty interested in see his son. And the old schooner, I don't know how high it was, but he used to wrap babies in blankets back then. And he was in his motor dory reaching up. And of course, mom was passing me down. I kind of slipped out through the blankets, they say. But he was a pretty fast young fellow, so he kind of grabbed me, you know, before I got out through the water. But uh, probably my instincts were telling me to swim back here, you know. It took him over 40 years, but Johnny finally did make his way back to Fortune Bay. He saw home for the first time in 1978. He came back here with his mother, and the sight of this place, the place he'd heard so much about growing up, 
moved him to tears. I don't know if there are any words for it. But all I can tell you was, it's like if you were gone from home for a long, long time and finally you, you got back, and then you know you just, you just couldn't help it. You just broke down. Plus the, the things that had happened between the time we left and I got back here, like my grandparents were gone then and so was my father. And all these things, you know, they just build up inside of you. Two years after, in 1980, Johnny moved to Fortune Bay permanently. He built this cabin in Miller's Passage, where he and his wife, Carm, spend their summers. But Johnny's permanent home is here, in Harbor Breton, about an hour and a half steam up the bay in Longliner. And Harbor Breton is where we found Bill O'Gorman and his wife, Anne, back for one of the many visits they've made to Fortune Bay ever since they realized the full historical family connection. Bill's grandfather's house still stands in Harbor Breton, the house a very young John O'Gorman and his wife once posed in front of, long before their destiny would take them to Lourdes. Well, it's, it's your, your heritage. It's where your people, your mom and dad, were born, you know, and you, you can't forget that stuff, you know, and this is where they, they, uh, they, they played as teenagers, you know, and, and very young people, and uh, they mix with, with their relatives, and, and this is what makes it so strong, so, so binding here to know that I still got my relatives here, you know, the Roses and the Lamberts, you know. Well, now I can appreciate, I can appreciate the book more because like going to Miller's Passage and also to Sagona, like, you know, you can really, really put it together, you know, in your head. Like, I mean, I helped him with the book and I saw the pictures and I, I heard him talk about it and whatever, but now I have a, a real feeling for it. Bill's grandfather was from Harbor Breton, but his mother's people came from Miller's Passage, and that's a place he loves to go back to. Bill and Anne and some friends had been lucky enough to catch a ride on a longliner. The steam down the coast is a treat in itself, and when they get to Miller's Passage, there's the company of the Greens to look forward to, that and the mystique of the place, the place that was once the outport home of so many. It's hard to imagine now this beach lined with houses, but it was. It's hard to imagine the blow this little outport took in the 30s when so many of its people signed on for the journey of a lifetime, a journey that took them to a different culture on a far coast, a wilderness, a wilderness that was Lourdes. There are actual facts of what happened to the people in 1934, five and six and taken grand, proud Grand Bank fishermen and send them out hundreds of miles away and drop them off in the jungle and expect them to clear all that land, grow crops for themselves, hay for their cattle, because they brought their cattle with them, and provide a living. And back then, there was no such thing as unemployment. Times are better now, for sure, with fresh Fortune Bay scallops in the pan. Now, life in a place like Miller's Passage is romantic, cozy, and retired people like Johnny and Bill O'Gorman have time to enjoy it, savor it. The dirty 30s are just a distant memory, not even that for them. It's a time that can only be imagined. A time when a small group of poor Fortune Bay fishing families left their homes to brave the unknown in the hopes of finding something better. Like my grandmother, Minnie Munger, you know, she always said, she said, if we never got anything for ourselves, we got something for our children, you know, and she said that so many times. It's, it's, I, it's emotional, you know. I guess she's happy to see you here today. Oh, yes, their spirits are here, let me tell you, and we sense it, you know. So happy 
knowing that this is where they, they all started and that they, they worked so hard to, to make a good living and they gave it all up uh, to start over again to make a better one for us. You know?